All right, so howdy. A little bit better, a little bit better. So I think it's appropriate that I went after Adam here uh, for a couple of different reasons. First of all, I'm from New Jersey, so uh, I didn't really take too much offense to that. But, um, but he touched on some topics that kind of led into my presentation, which will be very good and a very nice uh, segue into what I want to talk about. So what we're going to be talking about today is needs analysis and how to transition that into effective programming which I think a lot of you are going to be interested in uh, moving forward in your profession if you haven't done uh, a lot of this stuff already. So what am I going to talk about? We're going to talk about needs analysis for sport. So we're going to talk about what's today's training environment like, at least from my perspective. I'm also going to bring in a little bit of literature, just that knack of having a PhD or almost there. Um, I have to bring in some literature. And then also factors that you all need to consider when when analyzing sport, and you'll see that in your handout. And then same thing for an athlete needs analysis along the same lines, and then I'll kind of fold into or roll into some needs analysis transition into programming, which hopefully will kind of cap everything off for you guys. So why this topic? Why is this important? Um, and at least from my perspective, coming from the strength and conditioning field, um, it's highly specialized, which you all know these days. It's very, very highly specialized, especially with a lot of technology that's out there today, being able to track athletes, test athletes, and Adam alluded a lot of that to a lot of that earlier. Um, and then also, we know that knowledge of general training practices is not appropriate anymore, is, not, is no longer something that is just good enough. You need to go beyond that, and you need to have resources. You all are here at the conference, which is a good start, but there's a lot of things that you need to do beyond that, and I'll get into that a little bit. We also know that athletic demands are trying to trickling down to younger and younger athletes. And last year, if you were here, I talked about youth athlete specialization, uh, which is a completely different topic. Uh, so you kind of get a, a different perspective in terms of the demands of youth athletes in multi-sport and then also specializing in, in single sport where programming will become very highly important. And then also your ability to evaluate different sports, different positions, different athletes, maybe even tactical athletes or things or people that you might not even consider athletes um, is going to be huge in terms of moving the profession forward. And then also you see one of those signs, I adjusted the quote a little bit from that sign over there, but we know it's easier to build a foundation first strong foundation in any athlete, whether it's a youth athlete, professional athlete, first, and then not having to go back and repair a broken one. I know a lot of collegiate coaches talking to them, having been a collegiate strength coach for uh, a short while, a lot of athletes will come to you already broken down. And it's basically your job to keep them playing rather than improving on what you would probably want to improve on is strength conditioning or performance. So keep that in mind, especially when you're working with youth athletes. So here's my background, um, just to give you an idea. I've been in exercise science or exercise physiology, which w for whatever it seems like forever, 10 years or so of, of a background in education for that, um, which has helped me kind of steer a little bit towards the strength and conditioning field as well, because I've also been a strength and conditioning coach at the collegiate level and the private sector. So that meshing of those two is really, um, helped me in the professional realm and hopefully helped me moving forward. I've also dabbled a little bit in personal training, so hopefully I can give you a very broad perspective and cover most of your specialties here in this room. So certifications. I'm sure you all are familiar, especially with the NSCA ones, but there's a whole host of other ones just from these leading organizations, right? So this is important. And I always tell parents, make sure the people you're working with has something like this. Maybe, you know, the weekend ones are great, but these are the ones that, a lot of these are the ones that are highly respected in the field, especially we know the NSPA ones, as I'm sure you're familiar with. So this is very important, but is it the only thing? Absolutely not. So Lance Walker, that you'll hear speak later, has talked about getting reps. That's important. That means getting experience, being out there in the field, which a lot of you are, which is great. So I can learn from you, you can learn from me, everybody in this room can learn from each other, which is fantastic. But what you see here is people like Mike Boyle or Lance Walker or Martin Rooney for Training for Warriors. They all have a PT background, which is huge. But is it something that you absolutely need to be successful? No, it's not. Because you see some of these other people here who have been self-made, like um, Jim Smith at Diesel Crew or Joe DeFranco have built from essentially 
a small little warehouse that's maybe the size of this half a gym, maybe even smaller. Or Rob Shaw, maybe some of you know Rob Shaw, maybe you don't, he's in Jackson, Wyoming, training mountain and military athletes. A very, very unique perspective. I had the opportunity to spend some time with them a couple weeks back. So some things that you need to know is, is experience important? Yes. Is certification important? Yes. So how does that blend together? So looking at a balance. So yes, experience and reps is very important with hours in the weight room or on the field with your athlete. But also education, staying educated. Adam covered this a lot. If you don't stay educated and constantly reading the literature, constantly watching things online, sifting through all that information, that web of knowledge that's out there, and becoming a different strength coach or kind of transforming your perspectives or molding that, you're not becoming a good strength coach. You're not, your athletes won't benefit from your, your training. So we also know that the collaboration application and that transforms into programming. So you have to collaborate with the professionals around you. Collaborate with people at institutions like here at Texas a and Collaborate with your athletic trainers. Collaborate with your, um, your physical therapist. Collaborate with anybody else that's out there. Your sport specific coaches is very important to get feedback and they should get feedback from you. Does that always happen? No, we know that, um, which is one of the big problems in our field. So looking at sport, right? So looking at a needs analysis. So hopefully you all have some sort of perspective on this moving forward, but let me give you some ideas of why we struggle these days evaluating the sports that we train. Maybe we have time constraints. A lot of you get paid very little to train a lot of athletes, and I know that. I've been there. I'm still fighting that fight for sure, trying to decide where I want to move forward. Um, but it's very important, again, to not make that an excuse. Find a way to evaluate your sports even though you might not have time. The other thing that you might consider in this field, and Lance has talked about this, Lance Walker has talked about this in the past, is are you a tourist in this field? Are you somebody who's part-time kind of just doing, eh, I don't know if I really want to do this, but it's a good money making some, you know, training some athletes, but it's not my full-time job and I'm not going to put my full effort into it. You need to decide if you want to be in this field or not. You're not doing your athletes any justice by just being a part-time kind of just tourist in this field, kind of want to do it, kind of not. So that's important. Maybe you have limited experience or expertise. Again, get your reps. Get reps with other people, right? Find people who are in the field that have the experience and spend some time with them, even if it's a little bit of time, try to spend as much time as possible and try to get your athletic variety. And I'll show you what I mean by that later on in this presentation. And then your resources. That's not an excuse. Why? Because you, A, you may have a facility like Texas A&M, which if you've been around this campus has gorgeous facilities. But then you also may be like a guy that I read about in, um, I think it's Athletic Training Journal recently, that he's in a small school out in Nevada. And he basically built his weight room by going to Home Depot, building slosh pipes, building, you know, using tires, using sledgehammers, using that sort of stuff, and basically built his weight room because they couldn't afford to outfit it with nice technology that you might see at a bigger institution. And that's how he trained his athletes. And the whole article is about that. So I encourage you to maybe try to look for that. I can talk to you afterward if you're interested in, in knowing more about that article. But that's also something to consider. And then educational limitations. Again, you're here, so that's a good start, but there are other things that you can do. So, what are some challenges, some different athletic perspectives? Probably all of you are very familiar with football, baseball, basketball, soccer, maybe even sports that are very relevant in this field or very highly visible in our country. But what about things like this? This is squash, in case you didn't recognize that. It's a big deal. It's a big D1 sport where I'm from. I'm from, like I said earlier, New Jersey or the Northeast, right? So it's a Division I sport. You might come across that. So how do you apply or take what you know about the sports that are highly visible that you train and apply it to a sport like that. Something I had to do when I was at George Washington um, a couple years back. Same thing, same place, I had to apply it to crew. It is a collegiate sport around this country where there's actually water, maybe not here. Um, but crew is a big deal and it's a big deal around the world as well. So that's maybe something that you might see. Here's something that you might not realize. Now here at Texas A&M, we actually do work with firefighters and police in Bryan College Station area. Um, but something that's interesting is, this is kind of my perspective of where strength and conditioning may go in the tactical side of things. And we know that TSAC is becoming huge. So ABLE 
out of the University of Kentucky. Here's my research, and then I would kind of weave that in this sort of presentation. Um, but this is the resources that you need to find. This is an SCJ, Strength and Conditioning Journal, put out by the NSCA. This is an article he published, and he basically breaks it down for you. Here's the tasks that you might see. And he, before he got his PhD, was a firefighter, so I trust his research. Um, but here's the energy systems that you might use for these tasks. And then it tells you the intensity and duration that they might be doing them. So, okay, here's the beginning of how my training program or how my periodization is going to form. What about this? Now, it's maybe hard to see because the lights are on here, but here you have some tasks, again, more specific. So, um, something like a hose hoist basically tells you the plane of motion, is it single versus multi-joint, what muscle groups, and is core strength required. So now you know how to specifically train these particular types of athletes. You may not have been a firefighter yourself, you may have just seen them on TV or seen them at work or interacted with them, but you may not know exactly. So here is literature that you can go to and formulate a program. Again, common injuries. Now a lot of the injuries here that you can see are, are ergonomically related. Falls, awkward movements, um, things of that nature, overexertion. But the one thing you might not realize is these guys experience a lot of cardiovascular disease, and that's one of the things we test here at a and with our firefighters and police, um, is the cardiovascular disease. Why? Because their hours are so awkward. 12-hour shifts, what do they do? Basically nothing, sit around, maybe wash a truck here or there, and then all of a sudden, boom, they get a call. So that's something that is very interesting that you need to know. How about this? Cricket. Anybody seen this movie? Pretty good movie, right? Sport agent, professional baseball. Basically, his well dries up with professional athletes, can't get any more. So what does he do? He goes overseas and he gets, tries to take pitchers or bowlers from cricket and convert them into Major League Baseball pitchers, based on a true story. So guess what? A lot of sport analysis goes into that, maybe even more positional. So guess what? There's also a paper by Johnstone out of the UK talking about cricket, where cricket is big. Cricket is also in this country, but not quite as big. But looking at different positions, so we know overall cricket is more of aerobic endurance uh, required, a little bit. You can kind of compare it to baseball. Bowlers or pitchers, we can think about a lot of acceleration and deceleration over the course of multiple events throughout, uh, throughout a particular game. But then also maybe you have more of a fielder that is mostly aerobic, just kind of hanging out. Um, and then every once in a while, boom, you have an anaerobic bout of something to do, high intensity, less than 2% of the game. So how are you going to train these positions differently within that same sport is something that you might need to know if you have come across an athlete like that. Again, these resources are there. This is out of SDJ as well. So I'm just trying to show you that it's out there. So what do you need to look at when you're analyzing a particular sport? And this is in your handout here. So the very first thing that I would consider is what's the level of my athlete? Adam touched on this a little bit previously. And also what, what positions are you considering? So let's look at more of a movement analysis. Again, looking at planes of movement, looking at movement directions. This is highly important in terms of the specificity of your programming for your particular sport, for your particular athlete. Again, also looking at more of a functional standpoint. How does, what's the muscular interaction, what's the joint interaction, what's primarily involved in the movement of my particular sport that I might be training? And how is it similar to things I already know? And then looking at some other things that are related to sport, some sport movement, right? Am I more unilateral dominant, more am I bilateral dominant? How am I going to train that? Um, maybe somebody is already, or some of my athletes are already unilateral dominant for some reason, and I need to figure out why. Okay, physiological analysis. Again, looking at more of an aerobic or anaerobic, right? High intensity versus more long duration, low intensity, or do I have a combination of both? And one of the best examples I like to use for a lot of my students is football, right? We're all familiar with football from Texas, right? So, um, the combination, right? We think of football as highly anaerobic, right? High intensity, short bouts, 10 to 15 second plays, maybe. But guess what? We have to recover every play, right? So the recovery is much longer than the actual play itself, and we have to do that over four quarters. So you have to think about that sort of stuff. Does that mean you have to tell your athletes to go run, I don't know, five miles during the summer for their training program to get ready for um, their fall season? No, probably not. They probably want to consider other types of aerobic training. And then also looking here, a lot of different components here that you're probably familiar with. This one I like to key in on, climatization, right? That's big here in Texas. Guess what? Here at A&M, under Mike Sherman, when I first got here four years ago, A&M's football team was terrible in the second half. 
I don't know if you remember that. It was horrible. That's why I got fired, basically. Um, but a lot of times, what they were trying to do is train indoors. We have a beautiful facility here inside. We spent a lot of time indoors. That caused a lot of problems in terms of trying to play in the heat in the second half. So think of things like that. Okay. Then we have other things. What are our extremity utilities? What is primarily being used? Okay, so you have maybe a javelin thrower versus somebody who's more of a tennis player or somebody who's a wrestler is very different. And then also you have to understand what's the primary parts of the skeleton being used or primarily being injured maybe. So the axial skeleton being more your central focus of your skeleton versus the appendicular, things that extend beyond what you would generally consider your core structure. And then your injury analysis, this is important. What are the common indus in industry injuries in your particular sport? So you might think, okay, joint injuries, um, ligament tears, all that sort of stuff. But what I also think of is nutritional disorders. I also think of psychological issues, maybe illnesses and infections, such as upper respiratory infections. Big in a lot of distance runners and a lot of endurance athletes. So these are things you need to know when you're building a training program. How about athletes? Let's go through the same thing, sort of. So how do we currently evaluate our athletes? I see it in a couple different ways. I see that we don't do any evaluation. There's a, couple, there's a lot of people in the field that don't do anything in terms of evaluating their athletes. They think, okay, I was a football player back in college. I'm going to train everybody like a football player because that's all I know. I don't want to extend beyond my comfort zone, right? I don't want to learn more. So I train everybody like that. I don't do any testing or tracking of training progress. I said that that's no longer acceptable in this field. If you want to be successful. Maybe we do a little bit of limited preseason fitness testing. So in college, um, like Adam, I was also kind of the strength coach for my team that I played on. I was a Division three athlete in two sports, and um, I kind of took on that role, um, if you will. So a lot of times what we did was we just did preseason testing. That's it. Just come in. Okay, you're ready. I was a soccer athlete in the fall. So that was it. We just did preseason conditioning. That was it. No strength testing. Coach didn't care. Um, and we didn't track or tra you know, track any progress. He didn't even care beyond when we ran a two mile. It was like, okay, ran a two mile, great. That's it. So that, again, also I don't see as really being able to push the field forward. Then we also do a pretty good job. Some people do a good job of strength and conditioning testing. Okay, so we do track athlete progress. We do single time point, multiple time point testing. That's very good. We also may forget, we do such a great job up here, we also may forget some of this especially with your older athletes, like I said, starting to break down, that may actually be even more important than some of the strength conditioning components. So your balance, mobility, stability, flexibility, things like that. Things that are broken down over time, maybe because of injuries, maybe just because of sheer overuse or overreaching. Then you also have people who do an awesome job at looking at a comprehensive training battery. And again, that's pretty much incorporating everything that I've said is positive thus far. But then there's also really no excuse these days in terms of tracking your athlete progress. Why? Because there's programs out there that you can go get or things that you can do to design for yourself to track your athlete progress, track things that they're doing. That's just one example up there. And then logically weaving it into your program. And again, Adam touched on that very nicely. How do you incorporate that? Maybe incorporate it as part of your dynamic warm-up. Maybe you do some of the other stuff um, as part of your programming so you're not wasting time. And then the other thing that you might want to consider is daily monitoring. A lot of places do do this very well. Most people don't consider it. Why? Because it's, it can take a little bit of time, or you just don't know, which is okay. That's why you're here. So daily monitoring is really what we're getting down to the nuts and bolts these days. Why? Because technology is so good. But analyzing fatigue, coming in for a daily workout, where's my athlete's fatigue at? Where's my whole team's fatigue at? How do I adjust my training accordingly? Looking at hydration status, very simple in terms of giving them here a urine color chart to determine kind of a crude way in terms of where they are for that particular day. And then maybe communication with a registered dietitian in terms of your nutrition status that might be an issue. Again, looking at mood and sleep quality. Sleep quality is easy. You got a lot of apps out there on your phone that you can tell your athletes to go get. They can monitor their sleep quality. How many times they wake up at night, how many times they toss and turn, do they get good sleep, bad sleep. How are things going? So that's just a couple of thoughts about where you might want to be. And then again, here, obviously, this is pretty easy or something that you might want to do that's pretty recognizable is injury, soreness, aches, and pains.
That's important. We want to know how the previous workout went, how did the previous competition go, things of that nature. So what happens if you come across an athlete like this? So I spent time with Rob Shaw, like I said, in Wyoming. They come across athletes like this, guys climbing uh, some sort of rock face. But that's what they do. They program for athletes like that, which completely spins my perspective on its axis because I'm familiar with more of the visual type athletes or highly visible ath athletes in sports. So thinking about that, how about this guy here? This is one of the people we did some research with. He did the Tour Divide race, which goes from basically Mexican border up to Canada. He did it up and back. So we tested him two years ago. What actually happened? How do you design a training program for that where you're doing a mountain bike race self-supported for 44 days and you're traveling 5,700 miles. You don't know when you're going to get the next food. You don't have some sort of support team. You don't know if your bike's going to break down. You don't know how much sleep you're going to get from day to day. How do you train for that? He's not taking any supplements with him because it, it, everything he has, and guess what? It's right here on his bike. So very interesting perspective. How do you train somebody like that? How about this, right? Alpinus. And this is what they do up at Mountain Athlete Institute a test that they do, an assessment on their particular athlete. What about this? Number one, this is all in one, one bout. Thousand step ups on a 16 inch box. How hard would that be just to do body weight? Forget a 40 pound pack. This is just the half of what the program, here's the other half. Get up, look at this. Guess what, after you do all that, 12 miles. So think about how you might train somebody for that particular event. It's something I had to think about when I was spending time with them a couple weeks ago. Um, and again, took my perspective on a completely different axis. How the heck do you get that kind of volume in your program? So just to give you an idea. How about this? So Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, right? BJJ. Kind of becoming more highly visible because of MMA, right? So there is actually literature on here, Brian Jones, out of Georgetown College has done some research on some of the strength and power needs. So again, this is in the literature again out of SCJ. I just pulled some of this out, but gives you an idea of, obviously we know these athletes are very powerful, but you also need to take into consideration some of the grip strength that's necessary. And it, again, it's by weight class, like a wrestler, um, which is part of my background. So again, I think about high relative strength, right? For your body weight, you want to be as strong and as powerful as possible. And then also looking at conditioning needs. You're familiar with wrestling at all, same kind of concept, short matches. But you might come across more elite level that may be spending 10 minutes in a match, which is completely different than a more baby half that time. And then again, in tournament style situations, you may have to do that over and over and over and over again. So again, how do we train that um, into a strength and power type athlete? So again, this information is out there if you come across athletes like that. And then we know flexibility, mobility, stability, these type of athletes are key. Why? because they are working to submit their opponent. Take them down and submit them, right? So that's the name of the game in BJJ. So you want to know what specifically you need to address, and that information's out there. And again, injury prevention, things you might want to focus on, strength and a full range of motion. Um, moving forward, what about these types of athletes? These guys are different. Motocross, bicycle motocross, athletes different than a cyclist. Right? So somebody you might see t doing the Tour de France is going to train completely different, or somebody the triathlete is going to train completely different on a bike than these guys are. And if you read some of the literature, which there's none, basically, on these types of athletes, and these guys here that did some research, again, this is out of SCJ, out of New Zealand, did some research on these types of athletes. And I, I'm certainly not familiar with these types of athletes, but it's interesting to, to look at what's going on with the racing analysis. It's a very short bout. I equated this to a three or 400 meter sprint around a track, basically. With a powerful start, you're starting in a heat of eight riders, basically starting in a heat just like you would a track meet, okay? And the entire race is contested from a standing position. Interesting. So here's some of your racing components. Obviously, the start is most crucial, and that's where you're gonna get a lot of your power. But again, a lot of jumping and pedaling is involved. We know our start and our pedaling is a lot of hip extension. So a lot of the power that we typically train may be using Olympic lifts and things of that nature. It's trying to extend the hips. Um, that's very important for these guys as well. But also they do something called pumping, which is basically not pedaling or not jumping or not doing anything. They're moving side to side to get as much momentum to move forward as possible, which is something different you have to consider in your training program. And then it just gives you an idea of some of the power outputs that you would need. Um, is this indicative of how well they're going to perform? Eh, probably not, but it's something that you certainly want to consider. Okay, so looking at the other sheet in your handout, 
we're going to evaluate athletes. So what's the specific things that you need to know? You may need to know their training age, their training level. What's, um, what's their sport? What's their position? Again, it's going back to soccer, if I'm a goalkeeper, my demands are very different from somebody who plays in the midfield, if you're familiar with soccer at all. Okay? So you need to know this. The other thing you need to know is their history. This is important, and I know, again, Adam touched on this a lot, but what's their current sports? You may be dealing with a high school athlete that is a three-sport athlete, and hopefully they are, because if you listen to my presentation last year, that was very important, I think, not to specialize too early. Um, looking at their training age, it's not their training age overall. It's not like, oh, I spent three years in the weight room. It's what specifically do you know um, or have, do you have experience with? And then injury history. So you may think, okay, injuries, broken bones, ACL tears, ankle sprains, things like that. M more minor injuries, maybe even more major injuries. Guess what? Here's something that's very, very prevalent in the field today, right? Especially football, concussion, preventing concussion. Then you also have some other things that you might consider, which are more nutritional disorders, okay? The things you want to know about your athlete, and that may cause certain things unilaterally and bilaterally issues that you may have to address in your program. What about physical testing and evaluation? There are a lot of things you have to consider. And these are just some of my thoughts from anywhere, and there's no textbook to read this, or there might be papers out on this, but this is something I put together just to kind of give you an idea of some of the things you may want to consider. One of the things I want to focus on is arch and foot morphology. Why? Because if you're in any ground-based sport, your feet are the thing that is contacting the ground. So if something's wrong with your feet, you're going to have issues up the chain. Right? So you want to consider how your athlete's feet are structured or maybe if they're having problems with the arches, things of that nature. And then you also want to test more physiological components. Again, going back to the sport analysis, what's important for your sport, you need to identify. For your athletes, you need to identify what you need to look at. I'm not telling you you have to look at every single one, just some. Maybe all. Same thing for the strength and movement and functioning. This is, again, what I think is pretty important for other athletes who uh, maybe are a higher level because they've probably established this, although some of the NBA guys I work with don't have much of this. So, um, But again, you need to consider a lot of this stuff in addition to let's go straight into the weight room and get my power and get my strength. There are a lot of components that contribute to overall performance. And again, knowing primary training goals for your athletes and setting those early on. You need to communicate with your athlete, you need to communicate with your coaches, what do your coaches want. I had a strength, uh, a sport specific coach at GW, George Washington, he was a swim coach. And he told me basically coming on, I want my swimmers to Olympic lift. Okay, you want to develop power? Why? So he just thought it was cool that or thought it was a good idea that everybody should Olympic lift. I mean, he really didn't have any rationale behind that. And then I took some of his athletes in the weight room and tested them out. They weren't exactly ready to Olympic lift, not even close. So you have to understand, yes, communication is good, but you kind of have to understand where that all fits. Same thing with new exercise. You see a new exercise on YouTube? Like, oh, man, that'd be cool to make my athletes do. Well, maybe if it fits into your program, or maybe not. Where does it fit? So this kind of perspective you need to identify. Okay, so how do we get to effective programming? All right, so this is important, and I'm glad Adam touched on this because I don't really have time, and it's kind of beyond this lecture a little bit. But some of the things that you need to consider in your specific programming, maybe on a more daily type, microcycle type basis, things that are important in terms of your programming. Again, here's a paper by Dr. Kramer. Um, that kind of gives you an idea. This is for the warfighter, but this, this is out of um, this is out of uh, Journal of Strength Conditioning, so a little bit different. But this is for like a military athlete, but it can be converted to any type of athlete. Then looking at more periodization. So maybe you're familiar with periodization schemes, maybe you're not. Um, but I kind of want to go through a few here because I think it's important for you to consider before you even try to bridge that gap into programming. So linear periodization, very basic, mostly meant for your beginning type athletes, okay? Very just clean interaction between volume and intensity. Start out at a, low, or at a high volume, low intensity, and kind of that smooth transition um, 
to more of a low volume, high intensity, mostly targeting endurance outcomes initially or more muscular endurance, and then targeting more strength, power later on as the intensity increases. So each mesocycle is more towards one specific goal. It's very basic for your athletes who have a low training age or clients who have a low training age, right? Okay, more of a nonlinear. How about undulating, right? So you may have heard that buzz term here or there. Maybe you're very familiar with this type of programming, but this is more for your advanced type athlete, somebody who's more of a training age greater than three or four years, or if it's applicable to your type of program, however it fits in. But you're going to fluctuate your daily and weekly intensities and volumes um, rather than trying to do that smooth transition over the course of time, which is kind of different. You may, do, you may have, for example, three training zones, each microcycle, so your smallest component of programming, right? You might alternate between hypertrophy, maximal strength, and power endurance, for example, every week if my microcycle is a week, right? So I might have different workouts with those components in them. Um, why might I use this compared to traditional linear? Like I said, more training experience, why? Because the traditional linear periodization is not going to give my athletes, because they're advanced, the adaptations, or it's not going to allow them to constantly adapt to the training stimulus as opposed to um, a younger or inexperienced athlete uh, might on a traditional linear periodization. Then how about block? You think of what I think of when I think blocks, and I don't know how Texas high schools are structured, but we have block scheduling in high school in New Jersey, or at least some schools did, where you have basically a block of classes that you take versus just having the same classes over the course of time. So um, if you look at block periodization, that's basically what you're doing. High concentration of training workloads on a minimal number of fitness goals or fitness outcomes, right? So your focus is very strict in a block and then you move to the next block and then the next block. And that's self-determined. But most of the time it's three distinct mesocycles or three distinct blocks that you're gonna move in some type of progression. So more of an accumulation. So this may be shorter. If you have more experienced athletes, it might be longer. If you have more, or it might be longer if you have less experienced athletes. Um, and this is basic abilities, building basic abilities. Then what I think of is a transformation. Moving forward, transforming those basic abilities into more specific, um, more specific skill set or more specific strength or more specific things to that particular athlete's sport. Then also looking at the realization. My body is realizing some of the adaptations that I've created and it's now able to put it into use. That's my third block, that's my final block. I'm kind of capping off my training program. And that's how I see block periodization. Again, this is for a high training level, or high training age, greater than four years, or if it applies to your sport for more advanced athletes. What about the last one, conjugate periodization, okay? So this is more on a very small scale, we're thinking, microcycles, very small scale, manipulating those things maybe on a weekly basis. And we're looking at things that, again, training methodologies within, let's say, a microcycle is one week, alternating things on a one week scale. So you may have a maximal effort day. Then you might have more a dynamic effort day. So maximal effort is greater than 90% of your 1RM for most part in terms of a very high intensity. Maybe my dynamic effort is more of 50 or 60 of 1RM, lower intensity, more moderate intensity, and then maybe my repetition method is what we would traditionally think of as circuit-based method, which is obviously a little bit lower intensity, higher volume, um, less recovery. So these things, you might see these workouts multiple times in one microcycle or one week. I'll just give you an idea of different ways to structure your, your program. And again, this is for people of high training age. So how do we program? How do we contribute all this information to effective programming? Guess what? Let's bring back our firefighters because most of you are probably not familiar, just like I am, with training firefighters. And we're, we're going to try to get familiar with it. So again, this is, again, by Abel out of the University of Kentucky, looking at how do you build a training program, right? So this is back to what I presented earlier. So now we're looking at a nine-week training cycle for firefighters. Okay, this is how he did it and how he presented it in this journal article here. If you look at a lot of the linear training program that he developed for less experienced or less training age firefighters, then he has more of an undulating type program and a circuit training program. So if you're working with a firefighter, it's all laid out for you right here. So then now you need to take your own perspective and kind of mold it into what he's laid out here. And I think he's done a pretty nice job um, at least laying the groundwork.
Then if you look more specifically, this is the table I like because it gives you some things that they do. Again, looking at the hose hoist right here. So basically, if you look at here, he's telling you basically what is going on with a traditional lift. What type of traditional lift is going to most accurately replicate that hose hoist or, or train those particular muscle groups involved? So if you look here, he's got a DB bent over row. Okay, I can kind of see that. But maybe I want to incorporate something that's a little bit more specific in my training program. So here's something here. He's got a weighted hoist. So basically a weighted hoist from a tower, which is the, which is the picture right here, right? You may have seen this, I don't know, a while back they used to, ESPN used to, to run uh, firefighter competitions where they run up the stairs or they do the hose hoist or things like that. That's what I traditionally think of when I think what's more applicable for a, a training a firefighter. So these are the things that you need to consider. Maybe you need to put tables together for your athletes or look for research like this for training your athletes and building a periodization program. Okay, so let me give you some final thoughts on this particular topic here. So what I think and what we were talking about earlier is that we need to find a balance between experience and continuing education. That is key. Why? Because not all of us have the time or want to go on and, and maximize our education. Um, and not all of us have necessarily the experience. So you need to find a balance between both. And if you don't have that, you need to connect yourself with people who do to make yourself more well-rounded professional. Because guess what? It doesn't really matter what you guys have. It's really how it affects your athletes. You need to affect your athletes. And if you're not fulfilling what you need as a whole well-rounded individual as a strength or performance coach, you're not giving your athletes the most, and they're the ones who are going to suffer which is a problem. Okay, and then you also have to take time to evaluate sports. You have to carve out some time to do this. It's huge in terms of training strategy development and moving forward in this profession. If you don't have time, you need to, like I said, carve out time because it's very important and you can't just do the generic anymore. You can't just pull a program. I can't tell you how many times I've worked with athletes and it's like, okay, let me see your summer training program for your university. I look at it. I'm like, yep, that was pulled offline. Very non-specific, very basic, at a collegiate level that's no longer acceptable, right? So you need to kind of hone in on the, what's the literature out there, spend some time, even just a little bit, doing that. And then tracking your athlete's progress and evaluating them properly. Take the time to understand what modalities you can use on a specific level for your particular athletes. I don't care if you're a CrossFit athlete, you have a personal training, client, you have, you know, maybe a soccer athlete at the collegiate level, high school level, you need to find out what things are going to work for you on a daily basis or on a programming basis. And use your literature. Hopefully you're NSCA members. If you're not, you should be. And if you um, are and you want additional resources, sift through that stuff online. There's plenty out there and it's really your job to kind of sift through that information. Okay, the other thing is looking at training plan. So I have a couple of things here listed of things that you should consider when building a training program. Again, this is huge. Why? Because you need to make it a little bit more specific. If you take a collegiate strength conditioning program for a soccer player and try to give it to a middle school athlete, that's not appropriate. Right? That's not no longer applicable, so it's not necessarily a good idea. What are your training resources and facilities? Remember I talked about that guy in Nevada? Be innovative. Think about things outside the box. That's why it's important. I would have never kind of gotten that perspective. Now, I've trained with a lot of implements like that. But to build an entire weight room using that is kind of just a whole that's outside the box, right? So kind of think that way. I don't really think funding or facilities is really an excuse anymore um, because of those certain things. Uh, environmental factors are huge. Maybe you have to train at altitude. Maybe you're from Colorado or maybe you're from different areas of Texas where the altitude's higher. You have to consider that. Or if your athletes are going somewhere that's at a high altitude, if you're playing a higher altitude or, or hotter or colder. So if I'm in a playoff type situation, a lot of teams probably struggle coming to Texas, I bet, because of the, the change in, in climate. Okay, training timeline, you have to consider that. Also, sport position specific evaluation. Okay, so you have to understand that. Hopefully, I've given you enough factors to look at that. And then communication with your coaches and performance staff. I can't tell you how important that is because you yourself as one person is not enough. 
right? You need different perspectives from this person, your athletic trainer, your physical therapist, the people who are dietitians, maybe a sports psychologist. A lot of things, the inner work, and if you look at an institution that's very successful, like a Texas A&M or maybe somewhere else, that's what they do. They reach out, or they pull people in from the outside and they grab people who have this type of experience because one person knows that they can't possibly have as well-rounded of a perspective as multiple people together, okay? And then individual athlete evaluation and, and how, do you pro how do you progress through that is important. And then last thing, be logical, common sense. That's one thing I've learned going and getting my PhD is that a lot of people are very smart, but guess what, they don't have a lot of common sense. Um, so that's kind of where your perspective you need to pull in. Um, you guys are out there in the field, which is great. And you need to pull in all those resources and then use the people who have, we'll call it the book smart or the literature, and become book smart and meld that with your common sense and you'll be much better off than people who just stick with the education and the education only. Okay? And then learn from your programming strengths and weaknesses. That is probably the most important. Right, learning from what you've done. Again, Adam touched on this. If you're not progressing your programming, if I say, okay, this worked in 2005, I'm gonna use this again in 2015, probably not going to be as effective. Why? Because things have changed, right? A lot of things have changed. So you need to learn from your strengths and weaknesses. One thing I learned from spending time up in Wyoming with Rob Shaw is that what they do is they're constantly collaborating within their staff. What's our program weaknesses? What are we missing? What can we improve upon? Constantly analyzing the program, how can we make that better? 